This is also about precision medicine, and this time we're talking about precision medicine role in metastatic recidial cancer, the FF FGFR test to treat approach. So this is my disclosure. This is our agenda for the presentation. So where do we come from in urethral cancer? I know we started with platinums back in 1970s, and then there was this MVAC, and I guess a uh, few of the doctors here have actually used MVAC. Did anybody here use MVAC in the bladder cancer? I yes. Guess. Yes. yes, I use it. Us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> only, <laughs> only us actually, MVAC, and then there comes this study where there is gemcitabin, Platinum versus MVAC, and then cisplatin plus docetaxel, taxol combination with gemcitabin and platinum. And then we went into venophylin and with gemcitabin in the, in the further in 2015 and beyond. So the traditional figure in first line bladder cancer is relatively a chemo sensitive disease. So usually we are the, the question is, are we fit for cisplatin or are we ineligible for cisplatin? So basically if, when you was fit to cisplatin, the point was this study, very classic study with cisplatin based combination provide progression free survival of around 7.7 slash 9.5 months response rate in range of around 50 to 65%. This is the study where we compare gemcitabine, cisplatin versus MVAC and they seem around to be similar. In numbers, actually, MVAC was a little bit stronger, but it was a terribly toxic protocol. So we just like went with the gemcitabine cisplatin. However, in cisplatin ineligible, carbo-based combination provide progression-free survival of around six months, a little bit lower in the range of 40 to 45%, and overall survival of around nine months. So you will lose um, a few months when you go down to carboplatin versus uh, the cisplatin. So the question that we have after that, so we can, can we maintain the action after chemo? So different maintenance studies in the past failed to demonstrate benefit of this study. We have the major study, we have the LAM study, one was the Javlor, the Venfofilin, and the Lapitinib EGFR family inhibitor, and both of them were actually not uh, completely positive. So our building of chemotherapy-based standard of care sequence, so we start with cisplatin, eligible. If yes, then it's cisplatin chemotherapy. If no, it's carbo. Then we start for follow-up. And then on relapse, we can give uh, venfofilin uh, and docetaxel and paclitaxel in 2017. This is a uh, standard of care at this time. And then challenging chemo in first line, IO is an option. So Atezo uh, in the Invigor uh, 210 cohort 1, was atezo first uh, as first line treatment in cisplatin ineligible patient with locally advanced and metastatic urethral cancer. This phase two trial was actually turned out to be uh, uh, positive. It was statistically positive, although not clinically meaningful, with a modest two months improvement when they added the chemotherapy to the IO. So we have the one with IO as an option uh, by itself, and then we have the IO with chemotherapy. Based on this, our standard of care in from 2018 and 2021, cisplatin eligible. If yes, you can go with cisplatin chemotherapy. If not eligible, you can go with carboplatin-based chemotherapy. If you are all through platinum ineligible, then we can go with pemperlizumab plus atezolizumab. Then we started revisiting maintenance, as we said a few slides back, that was the venfolin and the lapatinib, where it was negative. Then they started considering a continuous treatment with a well-tolerated drug and something in, in between switch maintenance or continuation of the intensification maintenance. And by this came the Javelin Bladder 100 study design with a valimumab from Pfizer. And it was actually randomizing the patient who are under control with a gemcitabine cisplatin to a valimumab versus best supportive care with a primary endpoint as overall survival. When you look at the Captain Mark curves on the bottom, you'd find that the median overall survival was actually 21 months versus 14.3 months for the control arm. So clearly, Avalimumab um, showed um, a benefit for this kind of um, uh, maintenance uh, approach in a switch maintenance um, option. Of course, PDL1 status was positive in those patients. So building the standard of care again from 20, uh, 2021 to 2022, we have the same situation. However, when if you 
like went to a cisplatin chemotherapy or carboplatin chemotherapy, and you do not have a progressive disease, then you can go into avalimumab maintenance as an option for you. Again, to the current standard of care, you, you have to design it. So basically, in 2022, it gets more developed with the addition, if you have cisplatin and chemotherapy and carboplatin-based chemotherapy, and you have progressive disease, you can either go into a checkpoint inhibitor, you can uh, have an erdafatinib, for example, and if you're no progression, you can go with avalimumab maintenance. If you have a platinum ineligible, you started with immunotherapy, so in progression, you can go with the later lines. That can also include erdafatinib that we're gonna discuss, and we have infortumab, vidotin, and sasitizumab, both of them are antibody drug conjugates. So what are standard of care challenges as we have presented? There is a percentage of patients who do not respond to first line platinum chemotherapy and will require second line treatments. Again, even with maintenance, the progression-free survival in the intention to treat population in the avalimumab arm was short in 3.7 months. So we do not select well those patients with an unexpected greater benefit. Also, different treatment options beyond platinum. How do we match the best option for each particular patient? So can we change paradigm? And here comes the precision medicine. So personalized medicine, as refers to, is a medical model that separates people into different groups with medical decisions, practices, interventions, and or products being tailored to the individual patient based on their predicted response or risk of disease. So is, EGF, uh, is FGFR, FGF relevant for cancer? The oncogenic role for the FGF signaling and driving cancer cell proliferation, survival, migration, and invasion is mediated by the upregulation of the FGF and FGF genetic alteration, angiogenesis, and immune evasion. So what about the percentage? Cancer types that har harbor alteration in the FGFR are a lot. They can exist in many cancers and they, with different percentages. But if we are interested in urocelic cancer, so this is are the numbers. We have a 6% FGFR3 fusions. We have 10 to up to 60% FGFR3 mutations. We have around 7% FGFR1 amplification. So FGFR ultra is basically in general, it would be around 15 to 20% of advanced urocelial cancer was mutated FGFR in 54% in upper tract urocelial cancer. When we go to uh, the, our validated predictive biomarkers, the molecular screening to identify patients for treatment with selective FGFR inhibitor is targeting cases with gene fusion and mutation. If you remember the previous slide, we actually talk about fusion, mutation, and amplification. However, the amplification do not seem to be predictive uh, to the response to this kind of inhibitors. So FGFR and frequency of receptor of semantic mutation, it is FGFR2 and FGFR3 are common and occur predominantly in the ligand binding and transmembrane domains of the receptor. So this is a fusion where different fusion patterns of FGFR can lead to variable expression of fusion proteins with the ability to induce ligand-independent receptor dimerization and oncogenic effects. FGFR3 TAS3 is an oncogene and has been found in urocelial carcinoma, among other tumors. So development of an anti-FGFR -FG compounds is actually was a crazy, um, a very challenging situation with a lot of molecules starting more than 10,000 compounds have been tested at the drug discovery level that only 250 compounds that uh, survive to the preclinical development. And in stage three, starting from the phases from zero to four, we have a lot of challenges and only one have uh, revived and survived the regulatory uh, approval till this point, which is one compound. So, first generation FGFR, TKI, ponatinib, uh, among other, operate as a multi targeted inhibitor. They have a profound anti FGFR inhibitor, and basically, since this is a very common uh, receptor on a lot of cells, led to a, a lot of disappointments, including uh, toxicities. So, as we saw in the previous uh, slide, a lot of drugs just keep fighting in a gladiator style to reach the final winner with erdafatinib and pimigatinib as the only um, contendants that uh, stay to uh, reach the final point of approval at the end. So, erdafatinib, 
with its first signals of a phase one studies just showed that all patients with uricillial cancer who responded to treatment with erdafatinib showed actually an FGFR mutation or gene fusion. So, and erdafatinib also showed tolerability and preliminary evidence of clinical activity in its phase one studies. So, this is the um, uh, BLC 2001 study design with erdafatinib in locally advanced or metastatic uricillial cancer, long term outcomes, in, and it shows a patient with metastatic or surgically unresectable locally advanced uricillial cancer and screening for FGFR mutation and fusion. It was randomized to the regimen uh, between erdafatinib uh, between two doses, and then the regimen three was eight milligram QD with progressive disease and well, that can be titrated to nine milligram with the primary endpoint was the overall response rates. So um, the erdafatinib phase two uh, study has a heavily pretreated group of patients. They have poor prognosis group, mostly FGFR mutation, uh, FGFR three mutation, and also some fusion between FGFR two and three. The number of the lines of prior treatment and description of the patient included in the study was actually interesting. So the number of lines of treatment was ranging between zero lines was around 11%, 46% have one line of therapy, 29% have two lines of therapy, and 14% have actually three or more lines of therapy. And we have 80% of those patients have visceral metastasis. Creatinine clearance is actually less than 60 milli milliliters per minute in around 53%. And this is very important when you're treating a tumor that's related to your genital urinary system, so, which is really common. FGFR alteration, as I told you, the fusion was around 25% and 75% have the FGFR3 mutation. So this is the outcome, 40%. And I will give you why the 40% is, 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 is interesting for us. Because basically you have an objective response rate of around 40%, 3% of them was complete response, 37% was partial response, and actually you have around 39% with a stable disease. So basically it gave an 80% chance of controlling your disease which is actually an, quite an interesting number in those patients. As again, if you remember, I'm talking about a patient who received one line, two line, and three lines of therapy in bladder cancer. So it's really, really astounding, uh, outstanding to, to see this kind of outcomes and effects in, in this uh, group of sometimes very heavily pretreated patients. And also what's interesting is that it, uh, the response was not specific to like the simple cases. Actually, they get quite an interesting group of benefit, like in seven from every, for the 20 patient with like liver metastasis. So even with a patient with high load of the disease, they got um, a good outcome, even in the worst prognosis patients. So this is the progression free survival was around 5.5 months and the overall survival was around 13.8 months in this group of patients. The duration and type of treatment was actually interesting. The short time of response, it take quite a short time for it to start acting. This is really important. Your patient is clinically not really on the stable side. So if you want to really get fast control, that would be really good. And the duration of, uh, of uh, response can be really, really good. And it passes easily um, a year in around 30% of your patients. So what about safety? So it's, it's never perfect in real life. So we have things that we have to, to take care of. However, if we, we are uh, vigilant, if we are really observant, then it will not lead into any kind of problems. We have to um, 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 measure and titrate based on the phosphate level because it's, you have a 77%, you have a chance of hyperphosphatemia. You have a chance, a quite an, a hefty chance of getting stomatitis. You can have a diarrhea and uh, some ocular events that can sometimes to have to, can mind to be um, a, a major nuisance. So managing patient on erdafatinib, this is not a drug that should be used with a patient, with a doctor that's not really trained on it. He has to understand how to do it in order to get the benefit and mitigate any kind of uh, problems or toxicities that can be controlled. So it, establishing means of communication with your, with your labs and, and your patient is really important. Stomatitis, dry mouth, you can use our regular um, agents, uh, dexamethasone mouth wash, Nail and skin changes can be used with creams and stuff like that. One of the things that's very important is a CSR with a kind of retinopathy. 
that can happen. It's, it's only 3% to get a, a high grade toxicity. However, it should be evaluated by your ophthalmologist on a regular basis during this therapy. And also testing of phosphate level is actually uh, like a standard monthly um, um, prerequisite. So based on this, uh, the FDA granted accelerated uh, approval toward the uh, FATINAP for metastatic urethelial cancer in, in like in, uh, in 2019 for patients with locally advanced or metastatic urethelial cancer with susceptible FGFR3 or 2 genetic alterations that had progressed during or following platinum-containing chemotherapy, including within 12 months of new adjuvant or adjuvant platinum-containing chemotherapy. And, and rapidly, the NCCN guidelines started adapting this uh, testing to, as, an, as, a, as a, a recommended option for the patient who are, and should be done ideally at diagnosis of an advanced and uh, um, bladder cancer. So you'll be prepared to use it uh, when you need to uh, after failure of platinum. The 2021 updated EAU um, uh, guidelines also recommend screening for the metastatic urethelial cancer patient at diagnosis of metastatic disease for GFR alteration to plan optimum treatment because simply you cannot just order it just before trying to use it because the time till the test will come, can delay your treatment, and some of our patients are not in a condition that will give them the time to just wait for results of lab to be uh, acquired. So erdafetinib is one of the preferred regimen post-platinum, according to NCCN guidelines, with pembrolizumab, nevo, avalimumab, erdafetinib, and infortumumab vidotin as an option uh, post-platinum. The dosing of, uh, of the erdafetinib is quite uh, interesting and, and should be titrated based on the serum phosphate level. It can, it can go from the range of 8 milligram according to the level of phosphate level. It's like um, a ruler that you can just adjust the dose of the drug based on it. And uh, this is the conclusion of my study. So treatment personalization in metastatic urethelial cancer is ready for its prime time. FGFR inhibitor represents the first successful example of targeted therapy in locally advanced and metastatic urethelial cancer. The highest level of evidence uh, among FGFR inhibitor is for erdafetinib with a solid clinical background and approval. And by this, I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ram, about your presentation. And uh, I have the last one question for you because uh, many practitioners do that. Um, if you are evaluating evalumab or any immunotherapy, for a blood and cancer, you can you ask it for BDL1 testing and not nominating the test of uh, of BDL1. Uh, in bladder, I think a TPS score is a validated yes. uh, score, not yes. a CPS yes. for breast cancer. Yes, this is and we should know about this testing because it will cost a, a lot of money if you are spending your um, Bembro uh, plus uh, Avilo or Atizo uh, without proper testing. Exactly. The proper testing with the trial Avilumab is TPS score 263 not 223 C3 as CPS score in breast cancer. Yes, I, I totally agree with you because we are transitioning. It's not uh, into precision medicine. And with precision medicine, you cannot skip any marker or any test that you need to get your predictive of what kind of therapy you're gonna use. So it's, as uh, Dr. Mohammed is saying, it's really important to test and to test right. So testing right, uh, quali the quality of testing, the means and the where you're testing, it's really important. It's, there is no sense in doing uh, wrong testing or inferior testing to, in the end, using very expensive treatments that might end up to be ineffective if you're not doing it right. So I second my comments to your words.